So today on Do, I want to talk to you from the life of one mom in the Old Testament. I want to bring you a message called uh, Loving Deeply and Holding Loosely. And that is a constant thing for moms of all ages. And we're going to go back in history, and I'll have time to give a long introduction. But I want you to look with me beginning in verse, um, let's look in verse number 16 of 2 Kings chapter number 4. Main characters here are Elijah the prophet, and then an unnamed woman who's called the Shunammite, because she's from a lady, a land named Shunam. And this is the story that they intertwine regarding her motherhood. Elijah said to her, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. She had no child up to that point. And she said, no, Lord, no, my Lord. Oh, oh, man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived. And she bore a son about that time the following spring, as Elisha said to her. When the child had grown, he's probably between the ages of four and eight when this happens. When the child has grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. And the father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. (laughs) Sounds like a dad, right? Come on. Just let the Bible speak. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother... The child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and shut the door behind him and went out. And she called to her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It's neither new new moon nor Sabbath. She said, all is well. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, urge the animal on, do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God, that's Elijah, by the way, at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there's the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, all is well. Now we're going to go through more verses than what I just read, but I I really wanted to start right there and just put a pause on it right there and then preach the rest of it as it comes. So when we're talking about motherhood, we're talking about I believe, having never been a mother, but having been a son, having a wife, a daughter, a stepmom, three sisters who are all moms, uh, and having pastored for 25 plus years, uh, I think I know a little bit about what goes on in the heart of a mom. And I would say this, um, it's a roller coaster. Some of the highest highs I think that a human being can feel must be in the heart of a mom who carries a life within her, something a man, contrary to popular news these days, that that a man can never know. A man can never understand what it's like to carry a human being inside and then to bring that human being out and then to hold that human being and to know that you are from that point ever changed. That's a mom's privilege. Now, fatherhood's good, and we'll talk about that in about a month, but, but motherhood is something that is not just good, there's, there's, there's an aspect of glory on it, but there's also, amidst the glory, there's a lot of groans. And so whereas their temptation for me today would be to package up something sweet and nice, and it's all sweet, and it's always nice, and it's always good, the fact is, as all the moms in the room would know that I'm lying, because they know that motherhood is both glory and groans. It's, it's both loving deeply, but holding loosely. Because that thing that's so precious to a mom is not actually hers. It's his. It's the Lord's. And so as much as we would, if we could, we would hold on to our kids and they would always be these little ones that need protection, need provision, need guidance. Need. There comes a day where we recognize, oh my goodness, we hold them tightly for a little while, but then we're called to hold them loosely for the rest of the while. 
And for moms, I believe that's particularly difficult. And so when I thought about that this week, actually it was last week, um, I, I, I realized this, this Shunammite woman in the Bible gives us in about 15 verses that, that roller coaster ride. And so let's walk through it. Can we walk through her life with her and begin with this? This is what I call, it begins with her fulfilled hope. Now, what we didn't read is that this woman has been married and her husband is old. He's an old man. We're going back thousands of years into a culture that older men married younger girls. And the purpose was for them to bring sons and daughters, primarily in that culture, sons unto an older man so he could continue his heritage and so on and so on. But for whatever reason, this woman had never conceived. And now her husband was an old man. It sounds that, that the natural process of hope in having a child for her had gone. And so Elijah has been blessed by this woman. The Bible also describes her as a wealthy woman. It's very interesting. It doesn't call her husband wealthy. It calls her wealthy. So I don't know what to make of that, but typically when we see that in the Bible, the Lord doesn't waste words. And if you went back earlier in this chapter, you would find out that she is called a wealthy woman and she wanted to use her wealth to bless the prophet. And so have you ever heard the phrase prophet's chamber? Have you ever heard that? If you're older, you probably heard that. It's a place in churches where they build housing, temporary housing for guest preachers that, that come through an area. And so it comes from this chapter. She built him a little prophet's house on top of their house, a place that he could come when he was traveling. He could stay. He could eat there. He had a bed there. He had a place to rest his head. And so she blessed him out of her wealth. And so here we come and he is getting a prophetic word for her. And the prophetic word is this, at this season, about this time next year, you will embrace a son. Now, what's interesting is Elijah had asked his servant, hey, I want to bless this lady. She's helped me. What can we do for her? Well, she didn't need money because she had money and Elijah didn't have any money. And she didn't need like advancement in the culture because she she actually offered to speak to the king and the people in power on her behalf that the king might do something for her. And she goes, no, I just want to stay with my own people. And finally, Gehazi, the servant said, hey, her husband's an old man. He's always working in the field and she doesn't have a son. And I love the prophetic word, like the prophetic and the practical merge sometimes. And so the prophet just says to her, hey, in about a year, right around this time, you're going to hold your baby boy. He didn't, he didn't hesitate. He didn't, he didn't put that prophetic hamburger helper on it to where if it didn't come to pass, he had a loophole to get out of the prophetic word. He just said, it's going to happen. I love prophecy like that. I love it when a prophetic person just lays it on the line and doesn't play mamby-pamby with it. So if it doesn't come to pass, they've got it. Well, I didn't quite say it that way. Elijah, this is a yes or no. Either it was going to come to pass or it wasn't going to come to pass. But look at her heart. This is where you start getting her mama's heart, This her female heart. When he says, you're going to have a baby boy, she's like, no, my Lord, oh, man of God, don't lie to your servant. So long had she desired this child and probably had given up hope that she would ever be a mom that when the word came, she's like, don't mess with me. Don't get my hopes up. Don't touch that thing that I've learned to keep low in my heart, that longing, that desire. I haven't gone there in a long time, prophet of God. So don't mess with me. Don't get my hopes up. Don't lie to me. And uh, he wasn't lying. Next verse, verse 17. But the woman conceived. And she bore a son about that time the following spring. As Elisha, I've been saying Elijah, y'all forgive me. I don't know my Bible. I'm just up here preaching. Um, (laughs) As as she bore a son about the time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. So Elisha says this prophetic word over her. She has a moment of, can it really be? And then three months later, she gets pregnant. And then nine months later, she's she's holding her baby boy. Uh, Let me just give you this real quick because everybody's been watching the news this week and we know what's going on with the Supreme Court and the political football that is abortion versus freedom of choice and we know how people get divided on that. Um, In a couple of weeks, I'm going to put out a video on our our television program that I just went hard after this issue and that's not my point this morning. My point this morning is to say this. It's undeniable in Scripture that God is revealed as the one who sovereignly opens the womb. That every conception is an expression of the will of the Father. No matter how 
that conception took place. There are illegitimate means of conception, but there are no illegitimate babies. And so this woman had her womb opened by Lord in a, by the Lord in a season of life where she least expected it. And the Bible is very clear that the Lord gifted her this baby. So let's go down into the second part of her story. Her fulfilled hope and then her solitary heart. Um, this is where hope turn to joy. We, we, we skip years between verse number 17 and verse number 18 because verse 18 opens up. When the child had grown, he went one, down one day, went out one day to his father among the reapers and he said to his father, oh my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry, carry the boy to his mother. It's the typical dad response. Rub some dirt on it, you'll be fine. I mean, that's typical dad response, but the little boy is hurting. Now, we know he's little because he's not so big that he can't be held in his mother's lap. We'll find out in a minute that the servant carried the ailing boy, so he's probably somewhere around the age between three and maybe seven or eight years old. And he's hurting. We don't know what it is. We have no idea. It's the morning hour. He goes out because he wants to be like a man with his daddy out in the field. And they're all working the field. Dad's focused on the plowing or the sowing or the reaping or the running of the the base of servants that he's got. I don't, you know, dad, we get locked into our stuff and we just think the little one's crying and whining. We're like, I I don't have time for this right now. Guys, we need to work on this, but this is true. We, We get locked in. We don't think, we don't sense the moment. Women, they intuit a dude's looking at the facts. He's got, I got this set of facts and I got a crying boy over here. He was crying yesterday and he was just a little bit of a whiner. He says to the servant, come get him, take him to his mama. And so the servant picks up the boy. And when he lifted him, verse 20, he brought him to his mother and the child sat on her lap till noon. And then he died. Now, if the dad had known it was this serious, he would not have been as indifferent. He He just didn't know. But mama knew. Mama held him in her lap from the morning until the midday. And you know, mama's what it's like when you've got, and especially back in this day where there was absolutely, I mean, next to nothing you can do medically for somebody. I I never forget Amy. Landon almost died twice before he was four years old. When he was three months old, he came from home from the hospital and started having these massive seizure episodes. And any time we laid him down to change his diaper, he would seize up and his eyes would roll back. And we took him to the primary care and they said, take him down to Eggleston. He was, he was in Eggleston for five days. Amy never left the room except to shower one day in Eggleston shower, but she stayed there by his side, EKG, spinal taps, all the stuff they do to a child. And they said, we can't figure out. There's no neurological stuff going on, but he's seizing and seizing and seizing. And we left that hospital and uh, they never did tell us what was wrong, but we, we were good Baptists back then. And we brought him home. We're like, I don't know if Baptists do this or not, but the Bible says do it. So we anointed him with oil. We laid hands on him and he never had seizures again. Jesus healed my son. When he was about four years old, I was away on a business trip and he stepped in an ant bed and we didn't know that he was allergic to ants. And he got bit four times and his eyes began to swell shut. His, his look, breathing became labored. He was at my in-law's farm. And I remember uh, Amy frantically calling me saying they were on the way to a doctor down the road. And they got there and that doctor gave him whatever they inject in the kids. I forget what it's called, but they got something in him. What's that stuff called? That's it right there. Thank you. Our house nurses over here. And uh, he, he was fine, but the doctor told him, the doctor's a believer, he said, if you had had to go to the hospital in 10 minutes, he would have been gone. And so from that point, Amy, from those moments through Landon's four years old, Landon is Amy's angel. He's like six feet tall, you know, 175 pounds now. If Amy could, she would still cradle that boy. Why? Because mama's hearts get attached in ways that daddy's hearts usually don't. Guys, I'm not indicting us. I'm just saying, let's be honest that God's wired us differently and he's put something inside of a healthy mom that, that longs to connect with that baby, longs to protect that baby. And mama here in this story is holding him and held him in his lap. You know she's praying. 
You know she's calling out to God. You know if there's anything in that, uh, you know, primitive medical world that she could have done, she would have done it. But ultimately, she's, she's reduced to holding him in her lap and calling on God and waiting to see what would happen. And the Bible says very succinctly, then he died. So life ambushed this woman. This woman that had not even really had hope that she'd ever be a mom. This woman who said to the prophet, don't don't get my hopes up. And then for at least four years, probably, she has this bundle of joy, this little boy, probably her whole life wrapped up in this child. And then life ambushed her and he's gone. But watch what she does. Watch this. I think this could be a point of instruction for women, even though this situation may not be yours. There's something about her because... God, I believe, made women to feel. I believe God has given women a a natural sensitivity, a natural compassion, a natural empathy. I just believe it's part of the DNA that God has instilled in women that men have less of. And so I love the fact that she's she's not denying her emotions, but let me show you in a moment what she is doing. She's denying that her emotions dictate her response. So watch this. She, she's savage in this moment. Look at her go into action. Verse number 21. She went up. She laid him on the bed of the man of God. She shut the door behind him. She went out. She called to her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may go quickly to the man of God and come back again. And he said, Why will you go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. In other words, there's no clear spiritual reason to go see Elisha. Why are you going to do it? She said, all is well. By the way, translated modern day, I got this. Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, urge the animal on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out. She came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Now, you can go back. I counted for you, but if you want to check me, there's nine separate actions in verses 21 through 25 that she took. Nine set. She didn't tell her husband. Nine separate actions that indicate to me this woman was being led in her spirit, not driven by her emotions. Doesn't mean she doesn't, didn't feel, but this is that mama instinct. That gets like locked in, gets locked in and says, "Uh, uh, uh, uh-uh-uh-uh, this is not going to happen. And I find it noteworthy that she had enough sense in this moment not to not to talk to her husband. This is a tough place for a lot of wives, a lot of moms. Whereas you want to honor the, the headship and the leadership of your man in the home. That's biblical. You don't have to like it. It's biblical. But at this point, she had to she had to figure out how do I honor him without allowing him to speak into the sensitive situation that requires a move of God. She said, now, notice what she didn't do. She didn't fall apart on the floor and accuse God. She didn't scream accusations against the the Holy One of Israel. She didn't just completely implode. She could have and nobody would have blamed her. She could have, she could have done what Job's wife did. I have mercy on Job. I mean, who else has buried 10 kids on the same day? And, and, and so we're not saying that if she had responded emotionally, it would have been unheard of. What I'm saying is there's something on her and in her that she went through this thing. And she said, I've got to connect with the heart and the hand of God for this thing. And so she, she moved forward. She didn't fall apart. She didn't panic. She didn't despair. She's operating in the spirit and she moved decisively by faith, takes her little boy, lays him on the bed of that prophet. She had made that room so that the power of God might rest in her house. She laid him on the bed, tells her husband, I'm going to see Elisha. Husband said, it's not Sunday. (laughs) And, And she said, I got this. All is well. You go back to the field. I got this. She's carrying that burden. Sometimes moms, women, wives 
carry something that their husbands can't understand. Don't have the capacity to connect with. And in this, this scene right here, it seems like the husband is so distant, he's just operating in the natural. But the wife knows if there's going to be breakthrough, it's not going to come through him, it's going to come through me. And I thank God that she didn't play around with it. And so let's go down into these verses 25 through 31 and look at her desperate hurt. Now watch this. So she's making her way to Elisha and he sees her coming from a distance. And he says to his servant, run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? And then this verse, that's kind of haunting. Is all well with the boy? And I like what she said. She says to the servant of the prophet, all is well. Now, there's two, two things here. First of all, she's riding on a donkey. She's got to get to the man of God. By the way, isn't it real good today that in the midst of your panic, you don't need the preacher? No, y'all didn't hear me on that. You don't need the prophet. You don't need the man. There is one mediator between God and man, and it's not your pastor. And it's not the famous YouTube prophet. But in her day, she had to get to Elisha because Elisha was the representative of God in power and truth in the land. So she, she's riding that distance the whole time. You know, she's wrestling in her heart with what's just happened and what needs to happen. And then so Elisha sends Gehazi down because Elisha knows this is odd. I see her coming from a distance. I know her. Why is she coming at this pace, at this hour, at this time of the day? He knows something's off. So he says, Gehazi, go meet her halfway. I want to know, is her husband okay? Is she okay? And ask about the boy. So Gehazi meets her coming this way. He's going that way. And Gehazi asks her the question. And I like this. She says, all is well. Now, I take that to mean that in the midst of her life imploding, in the midst of the worst possible circumstance she's ever been in, it's, it's worse for her to have never had that child, that son of promise that came, than to have him for four years and him be gone. And in the midst of it, she's saying, all is well. That... She's not going to bow to the reality of her circumstance when she addresses the status of her soul. Like, the death of a child is not well. It's not good. But she is literally expressing some level of faith that the wrong is going to be made right. That the despair is going to be temporary and the hope is going to arrive. That the, the death that has hit her household is not going to spread and die, cause her own spirit to die. So she's fighting and she's expressing faith. And I do like the fact that she's not going to cast the pearls of what's happening in, uh, before the servant. She needs to talk to the man of God. She's like, okay, Gehazi, I appreciate your concern, but uh, if you'll get out of the way, I need to talk to Elisha all is well. Because she knows that the man who spoke the prophecy is the man who can make this thing right. So these troubling questions for the mother, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Those are three questions that perhaps even the women in the room might want to answer. How are you doing? How's it going with your husband, if you have one? And is all well with your child or your children? Verse 27. When she came to the mountain of the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. For she is in bitter distress. Watch this. And the Lord has hidden it from me. And has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? She's speaking. She's speaking about the prophet. Did I ask you for a son? Didn't I say, don't deceive me? She's been carrying all of that inside. She didn't want to talk to her husband. She didn't want to talk to the guy leading her on the donkey. She didn't want to talk to Gehazi. She needed an audience with the man of God. She
she falls down in his feet. And now all that pent up emotion of a mom that is grieving comes between comes before the mediator. Elisha was her mediator between her and God. We have Jesus, but that's all she had. And she falls at the feet of the one who can help her. And she says, I never asked you to give me the gift of a boy. And you came to me. You prophesied over me. And what's interesting to me is Elisha knew something was wrong in the natural. I mean, you see her, she's grieving, something's up. But he says this, he says, the Lord's hidden it from me. Just a quick teaching note here. The Lord reserves the right to disclose, the Lord reserves the right to veil. I don't care who any prophet is, there are times where God says, I'm not going to tell you yet. You need to wait. And there was something in the plan of God that wanted Elisha to feel some of what the mom was feeling. So instead of God saying, while she was 200 yards away, her sons died, go raise them from the dead. Elisha needed to connect, not just spiritually, but relationally and emotionally with her. It's just a quick moment here that Jesus doesn't just stand. Jesus is our mediator, not Elisha. Jesus doesn't just stand on the edge of heaven and just speak stuff and fixing things, making it right. Jesus wants you in his presence, at his feet, as broken as you need to be if it's a broken season. He's not saying, stay over there, I'll fix it from a distance. He's saying, come and fall apart. I want to connect with you in everything you're feeling, in your loss, in your hurt, in your grief, in your confusion. I welcome you to come at my feet. And sometimes the servant, Gehazi, sometimes that's like the pastors or other Christians. When the person is trying to get broken before the feet of the mediator, the servants get in the way. It says that Gehazi was going to push her away. In other words, trouble not the master. And Gehazi says, no, let her come. I need to connect with her. I don't. The Lord hasn't revealed what's going on. And then he knows. He knows immediately that something has happened to her son. And so verse number 29, he said to Gehazi, tie up your garment, take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply. Lay my staff on the face of the child. So I don't know exactly what's happening here. I don't know if Elisha intended to go or he was saying, no, we're going to raise that kid. I don't even have to be in the room. Here's my staff, Gehazi. Go lay it on him. But look at what the mama says. The mama says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. In other words, I'm sticking close to you because you're the one with the answer. I appreciate your servant and I appreciate your staff, but your presence is what I need right now. I need to know that you're on this thing. You started this thing and you need to correct or fix this thing. And she's like, Gehazi can go on ahead, but you're coming with me. (laughs) That's bold faith. By the way, let me just go ahead and encourage you. The difference between sometimes standard status quo Christianity and breakthrough Christianity is expressions of bold faith. Now, we don't boss God around. He's sovereign. We're not. But there's something in the heart of the Lord that I can't deny in Scripture that there are times where people are bold with Jesus in the Gospels. There's times where the psalmist is bold with the Father in the in the in the Psalms. And God moves in ways that I sometimes wonder. I I wonder if he would not have moved that way had they not gotten that bold. You see it in the Gospels with Jesus. It's another mama who's got a demon-possessed daughter. She's a Syrophoenician. She's a Greek. She's a Gentile. She's got no claim on messianic power from Jesus. And Jesus is actually in a moment where she's begging for him to heal uh, her daughter, to deliver her daughter. Jesus is drawing out her faith by not immediately answering it. And finally, she says, call me a dog, if you will. If I'm a dog, I need the crumbs that will fall from your table. And And Jesus looks at her and he says, oh, my goodness, I've not seen bold faith like this in people. Go home. Your daughter is delivered. Now, we're such polite, evangelical charismatics. We would say, well, Lord, if it be your will and and, and God, if I I don't want to presume upon you, I don't want sometimes God wants to say, why don't you just get raw and desperate with me? Because I see it in your heart and you're afraid to let it out of your mouth. And if you'll confess it with your mouth and let it come out of your mouth, there might be some power coming into the situation. So mamas, I want to tell you, you don't have to keep it all within. 
So listen, go into the courts of heaven and plead your case before the judge who loves you and call out for a move of God on behalf of whatever it is that might be weighing your heart down. So verse 31, Gehazi went ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. So he returned to meet Elisha and told him the child is not awakened. So just get the scene real quick. So Gehazi runs ahead, booking it, heading to the house, got the staff of God in his hand. Far behind him is the older Elisha moving with the grieving mom. They're coming, but they're not moving as quick as Gehazi. Gehazi does what he's supposed to do, probably prays, probably does whatever the servant of the prophet would do. And then he says, ain't nothing going to happen. So he gets up, leaves the house, and he goes, and he, he comes back, and he's meeting them coming forward. And he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. The boy is still gone. Now, again, it's another opportunity for that mom to panic, to give up, to fall into a puddle, to get bitter with the prophet, to get angry with him. But she doesn't. They just keep moving the house. We're not even told what she or Elisha said. There's this noteworthy silence. It's almost like they got the evil report, and Elisha looks at her and says, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. Come on, girl. We're going. We're going. And they make their way to the scene of the grief. And that's where we'll finish. Look at her patient helplessness, because this is, this is a little agonizing, to be honest with you. The whole scene is, but it's a situation that she could not fix. I mean, she literally had to come to terms with the fact that she's not going to be able to fix this on her own. So when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. Not the boy's bed, Elisha's bed. The bed created from him in honor by this grieving, now grieving mother. The bed where Elisha had met and communed with God during traveling days. The bed where Elisha had found a safe, quiet, secret place with the Lord. And don't you think for a second that mama didn't know that when she put the body of her baby boy there. That lady's sharp as a tack, man. She knew exactly what she's doing. She says, I'm going to lay him down in the consecrated place. I'm going to put him down in this place that's hallowed. I'm going to put him before the, that it's as high as I can go in the house, and it's as holy as I can go in the house. I'm going to put my, my baby boy's little body there. But she doesn't get to go in the room. Look at verse 33. So Elisha went in, he went in, and shut the door behind the two of them, him and the boy. There's only so far this mama could go. She's done everything she could do. She did it wisely. She did it in the spirit. She did it with holy determination. She did it with a resolve that said, I'm not taking no for an answer. She didn't She didn't entrust the news to anybody but the prophet, the man of God, the only one in her day that could do anything about it. And so she gets to the moment and the prophet looks at her and he draws the curtain or shut the door. And there she is on the outside, having done all that she could do. All now she can do is wait. That's an excruciating place. And some of you ladies are in that place right now saying, what's going to happen to my kids? Some of you have adult kids that aren't walking with the Lord. You tried your best. You gave it a go and you weren't perfect, but God knows your heart. And if you could go back and fix the mistakes, you would. And you've come to a place where you're honest and real and raw about what you could have done better. But when you look at the situation, it looks like it's, it's inscribed with it's too late. And so you're stuck on the outside of a situation that you'd fix if you could get in. I mean, you would. You'd get in there and you'd undo everything that never could have been, should have been done. But you're on the outside of the veil. And on the other side of that veil, you can't see what's going on. But there's a mediator working. There's one behind the curtain working in ways that you don't know. 
There's one with all power to reverse the curse. There's one who raises the dead. There's one who restores life. There's one that makes all the bad good. There's one who has power and wisdom that you don't have. And I know it's hard because a mama wants to, she wants to help fix it. And Elisha, he just, I, he either shut a wooden door or drew a curtain, but either way, it was a signal that, Mama, you've done everything you can do. Now you've got to leave it with me. I think that's the word of the Lord for some that are in the room today. We're not talking about Elisha. We're talking about one greater than Elisha. We're talking about the king of Elisha. We're talking about Jesus who's working on the other side of a curtain or a door in the life of your children, and you can't see what he's doing, but don't you think for a second that he's not working. He knows exactly what he's doing. He he loves you, but he doesn't need your help. I mean, he doesn't. Go, go, come on. This is, that's supposed to free you, not frustrate you. Like he, there's just some stuff, ladies, that you can't fix. You can't undo. You don't need to be bitter with your husband who was too busy working to notice. You don't need to be upset with the, the church or the representative messenger of God because they said one thing, but this thing happened in your life. You just got to get, you got to get in that moment where you see Jesus working in the impossibility. Even though you're on the other side of the curtain, you got to see it by faith. You got to say to yourself, he's too good not to work on this thing. He's too faithful to leave it as it is. He, he, I can't fix it, but he can. And then if you'll get bold, you can, you can do this. You can say, not only can he, he must. See, some of y'all don't like that. You, you just got to come to this thing. You got to say, you must fix this thing. You must, Lord. And so he, verses 34 and 35, he went up and lay upon the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hand, hands on his hands. He stretched himself upon him. The flesh of the child became warm. Signs of life. Something's changing. Something's happening. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house. You know what that means? He came out from behind the curtain for a moment. That baby's still not alive and that mama's still sitting there. She doesn't say a word. She's just letting the process run its course. Elisha gets up, he's walking around the house, he goes back up into the room, stretches himself upon the child one more time, and the child, this is very strange, sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. That first sneeze, you know what happened in her heart. What was that? What? And then he does it again. And then again, and then maybe the next four, boom, boom, boom. And you know that hope, hope, oh, oh, the, the, the groan of glory, groanings that cannot be uttered, that vocabulary can't articulate. And then he opens his eyes. Now, I don't know, I have a little bit of a cinematic kind of imagination. So I see this in like, Letterbox, 16 by 9, high def. And I, I just picture, I picture Elisha. Well, just, I don't have to picture all of it. Look at what he said, verse 36. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. <laughs> what a boss. He's like, tell her, come on in here. Call the Shunammite. And when she came to him, he said, pick up your boy. Pick up your son. Now watch this. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. To the end, from the beginning of the crisis to the end of the crisis, she moved in the spirit, not in her flesh. I don't know how in the world that mama then pounce upon that baby boy who's sneezing and blinking. And she said, before that, I'm going to give thanks. Now, she's not worshiping Elisha. 
She's expressing her gratitude for what God just did through the man of God. Before she rejoiced horizontally, she rejoiced vertically. So what do we do with a passage like this? There's probably 50 different messages that are being preached by the Holy Spirit right now through this word. And what I want to encourage all of the daughters of God and any of the men that need to embrace this too, it's not just for the ladies, I want you to listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying. To some of you, he's saying, I'm not done yet with your children. To others of you, he's saying, I'm not done with you yet. I'm teaching you that I can work even when I'm on the other side of the curtain and you can't see. To some of you, I think, though it wasn't expressly written in the passage, to some of you, I think he's saying, I showed up here today on Mother's Day because I want to peel regret, shame, and deep layers of grief off of you. Doesn't mean you won't feel, but I'm going to tell you something. You're allowed to feel grief, but you're not allowed to live under the enslavement of grief. You're not. You say, well, Jeff, that's not fair because it's the way I feel. Get your emotions under the Holy Spirit yes. instead of the Holy Spirit being trapped beneath your emotions. And I say that firmly, but I say it in love. I'm not being insensitive. What I'm saying is there's something better for you than to be in a constant state of mourning for the rest of your days. And then I would just say this. If nothing else... <clears throat> This passage of scripture declares over all of us that no case is too helpless, no situation is too impossible, no breakthrough so unreasonable that God can't if you'll get bold. Be careful about to whom you speak the deepest things in your heart. She didn't tell her husband. I'm not advocating separation and marriage, but what I am saying is this. There's just some things that our spouses cannot carry for us. And God designed it that way. Because your spouse actually doesn't complete you. Jesus does. Your spouse compliments you, but doesn't complete you. So there are things where your spouse can't fix it. Your, your prophet can't fix it. Your priest, your pastor can't fix it. But that mediator that is unveiled. He is all yours. He is yours, but he doesn't always let you see what he's doing. Get bold and contend for the breakthrough that's bought with the blood of Jesus. I want you to stand to your feet, please.